Hello. In this video, we are going to discuss limits, both the concept of a limit, but also how to compute and evaluate limits. If you are asked to find the limit of a function, this means that you need to find out what happens to that function as x gets really, really close, but not equal to a certain x value. This is an extremely important concept in calculus, but also mathematics in general. We're going to see a number of examples of how to compute limits, but first let's take a closer look at the concept of what a limit is. Suppose f is a function and a is a real number. The expression the limit of f of x as x goes to a is equal to l, or another way of writing that is f of x approaches l as x approaches a. This means that the values of f of x, in other words the y values, are as close as we like to l for all x sufficiently close to a on either side of a, but not necessarily when x is equal to a. This might sound complicated, so let's take a look at what it means in a graphical example. So here we have a graph and we can see that the limit as x goes to 4 is equal to 8. The sentence, the values of f of x are as close as we like to L for all x sufficiently close to 4, means that if you choose a certain distance from L on the y-axis, then it's possible to specify the corresponding distance from 4 on the x-axis, so that for all x in that interval, the curve lies within this rectangle. Even if you specify a smaller distance from L on the y-axis, it's still possible to find a corresponding distance on the x-axis so that the curve lies within that rectangle. In effect, what this means is that for all x values close to 4, the y values are going to be close to 8. Here's another graphical example of a limit. Looking at the graph of this function, we can see that near x equals to 4, the y values are going to be near 3. This means that the limit is going to be equal to 3. It doesn't matter that f of 4 is equal to 6, because the limit only deals with x values that are close to 4, not necessarily x equals to 4. In this graphical example, let's have a look at the limit of f of x as x goes to 1. Looking at the graph of this function, we see that there isn't a particular y value that the curve approaches as x gets close to 1. This means that this limit does not exist. For the limit to exist, there would have to be one particular y value that the curve approaches both from the left and from the right. Here we are looking at the limit of x times sine 1 over x as x goes to 0. This limit is going to be equal to 0. Even though the function itself is undefined when x is equal to 0, we can see in the graph that if x is near 0, then the y values are going to be near 0 as well. So the limit as x goes to 0 of this function is equal to 0. Okay. We've now seen a number of examples of using graphs to look at limits, but it's not always possible to look at a graph to find the limit of a function. In fact, graphs can actually be misleading or imprecise or even give you an incorrect answer sometimes. So if you're asked to find the limit of a function, it's important that you do that using algebraic computations rather than looking at the graph of a function. Here are some basic facts that are going to help us with that. Suppose that c is any real number and n is a positive integer then the limit of x to the power of n as x goes to c is equal to c to the power of n. In other words, you can just insert x equals to c. In fact, if p of x is any polynomial, then the limit of p of x as x goes to c is equal to p of c. In other words, you just insert x equals to c. This also works for rational functions, provided that you don't have division by zero. So if p and q are polynomials, and q of c is not equal to zero, then you can just insert x equals to c to find the limit. Here's our first computational example. We're trying to find the limit of this rational function as x goes to 1. Notice that if we insert x equals to 1 into the denominator, we do not get 0. This means that there is no division by 0, and so to evaluate this limit, all we need to do is insert x equals to 1 in the entire expression, simplify, and the answer is equal to 1. In this example, we're evaluating the limit of another rational function, this time as x goes to 3. Let's insert x equals to 3 into the denominator. This time we do get 0. This means that we cannot simply insert x equals to 3 into the expression. The trick in this case is to factor. We're going to factor x to the power of 4 minus 81. It becomes x squared minus 9 times x squared plus 9. 
and the denominator factors as x minus 3 times x plus 6. We can actually factor these even further. x squared minus 9 becomes x minus 3 times x plus 3. Now notice that x minus 3 cancels out. Now we have no division by 0 anymore, so now we can actually insert x equals to 3 into the expression. We simplify and the final answer is 12. Here we have the limit of a piecewise defined function as x goes to negative 4. If x is near negative 4, this means that f of x is equal to 2x squared plus 4x minus 16 divided by x plus 4. So this is the expression that we should use to calculate the limit. We should factor the numerator to get 2x plus 8 times x minus 2. Factor even further by taking out a common 2. Now we see that x plus 4 cancels. This means that we no longer have division by 0, so we can insert x equals to negative 4, simplify, and the final answer is negative 12. Before moving on to the next example, let's have a look at the graph of this function. We've just calculated that the limit is equal to negative 12. It's not equal to negative 10. This is because the limit deals with what happens when x is near negative 4. It doesn't matter what happens when x is actually equal to negative 4. Here we have the limit of 2 square root of x minus 6 divided by x minus 9 as x goes to 9. Notice that in this case we do have division by 0, so we need to somehow rewrite this expression. The trick in this case is to multiply top and bottom by the conjugate, 2 square root of x plus 6 divided by 2 square root of x plus 6. We're not changing the value of this fraction because we're multiplying top and bottom by the same number, the same expression. The numerators, when you multiply them out, becomes 4x minus 36. And the denominators, we're going to leave those factored for now. Factoring out a 4 from the numerator, we see that x minus 9 cancels out. This is precisely what we wanted because now there's no division by 0 anymore. Now we can simply insert x equals to 9, compute the final answer, which is 1 over 3. Here we have a limit as x goes to 0, and again we have division by 0, so we need to somehow rewrite this expression. In this case, the numerator consists of several smaller quotients, so we have smaller quotients within the bigger quotient. The idea here is to put those on a common denominator. So we have 2 minus x plus 2 divided by 2 times x plus 2. Rewriting this, simplifying the very top numerator, we get negative x. Dividing by square root of x is the same as multiplying by 1 over square root of x. Now, negative x divided by square root of x becomes negative square root of x in the numerator. Now there's no longer any division by 0, so we can insert x equals to 0 and compute the final answer, which is 0. Next is a theorem that will help us evaluate certain types of limits. Suppose that we have three functions, f, g, and h so that f is the smallest and h is the biggest, at least when x is near a, except it doesn't matter what happens when x is equal to a. Also suppose that the limit of f of x as x goes to a is equal to l, and the limit of h is the same number, also equal to l. Then g of x is going to be squeezed or sandwiched between f and h, so the only possible value for this limit is l. Here's an example using the squeeze theorem to evaluate a limit. First we need to create those three functions, f, g, and h. Notice that cosine of any number is between plus and minus 1. We are now trying to make the middle portion of this more similar to the expression in the limit. Therefore we should multiply all three sides of this expression by x to the power of 4. Now to make it more similar to the expression in, in the limit, we need to add 2 to all three sides. We're allowed to do this as long as we do the same to all three sides. Now let's compute the limits of the smallest and the largest of these three expressions. So the limits of negative x to the power of 4 plus 2 as x goes to 0 is equal to 2. The limit of the largest expression is also equal to 2. This means that the middle expression is going to be squeezed between 2 and 2 and the only way for it to go is for the limit to be equal to 2. Now we've seen several techniques and tricks for evaluating limits. So let's summarize some of the strategies that we've seen. 
Direct substitution can be used when there is no division by zero. We've seen examples of factoring, uh, common denominators, they can often be used when you have multiple quotients within a bigger quotient. Multiplying by a conjugate, this is often used for when you have a square root plus or minus a number. And the square root could be either in the numerator or in the denominator. We've also seen the squeeze theorem. This is often used when you have functions involving cosine or sine, but there are other examples as well. So we've seen many examples of computing limits. As I mentioned earlier on, limits is a foundational topic in calculus and many parts of mathematics. For example, derivatives and integrals are defined using limits. So without limits, we would not be able to consider those concepts and things like velocities and many other topics in mathematics and other sciences but as well depend on limits. I hope that you found this uh, video useful. Please have a look at our practice problems as well. Good luck. to negative 4, simplify and the final answer is to negative 12.